Good. Good. Excellent. Um, Isle of Isle of uh, of Lewis. Uh, the myth surrounding giants there again. Aren't yes. There? Yeah. Isle of Lewis is one of my favourites, uh, especially Kalanish. Is it Tusakan Kalanish? Isn't it? Tusakan. Tusakan. Yeah. Well, they, they keep changing it. Again, Kalanish is modern. Tursakhan is the more Gaelic name. But there's another name before that. Uh, there's been a huge controversy about it. I was uh, reading some old uh, books uh, on the travels of Scottish people that went up to the islands in the 16th century, written in beautiful ancient English. Uh, and luckily, Google is now trying, uh, they're scanning a lot of these uh, hard to get, uh, excuse me, hard to get books. And um, when I've got spare time, as we all do right now, it's just a matter of looking around for old books on traveling through Scotland, and I'm following those people's travels, and they record the most minute uh, uh, um, and uh, strange details of their adventures and their horse carriages, and you're going, oh, God, there's no index. And then suddenly on page 486, there's a talk about the stones of the giant people when they were petrified into stone. I thought... I heard this story before in France. The standing stones mean the petrified images of giants, of tall people. I wonder if he's going to keep going. And uh, they, and then they gave me the, this name, which was uh, Kaleoanes, which is one of the oldest names of Kalanish. I thought, I've never heard of that one before. So I did a bit of work on the Kaleoanes, and uh, it turns out it's a mixture of Gaelic, Nordic, and Greek. And we know that the Nordic people were going there, obviously. We know that the Phoenicians were going all the way up the coast for about 4,000 years. So it wouldn't be out of question that a little bit of Greek eventually finds its way, uh, way to the Isle of Lewis. That's not unusual. And I thought, what does this mean? And Calais is very easy. It's a, a port or landing place. And um, Owanis was a bit more uh, hard to get hold of. It was so obvious that I didn't realize what it was at first. And I thought, well, Owanis, that's a... That's a Greek transliteration of one of the oldest gods on earth. Uh, Uwanu, uh, or Uwan Adapa, is one of the Anunnaki, one of the original gods that goes back to the time of the flood. Now, we know that the temples in Kalanish are not 12,000 years old. That's a given. Uh, the place was just not habitable back then. But that culture did survive until, it, uh, until the Sumerian culture, around 3000 BC, which is about the same period of time as when the Kalanish terms appear, apparently were put there. 3,500 BC is the, uh, uh, the technical date for Kalanish. So I finally realized that there's an association between this bloodline of, of Uwanu uh, and, the, uh, and the Anu people, the lords of Anu, also called the Watchers, by the way. Uh, that was their kind of nickname, or the Shining Ones. And it seemed, I mean, and that's what got me to do the uh, the whole documentary and eventually the book uh, that I'm still working on was the fact that who built these temples. And once I had that name, I began to suddenly track the uh, progress of these people, of these lords of Anu, who eventually become the Tuatha de Danu when they become part of the Scythian culture. And as they migrate through Europe, through Hungary, they gave the name to the uh, river that goes through there, the Danube. Uh, and then Denmark, that was also part of their the culture. And from there, they gave their lineage and their genes to the Nordic people, because these people were very tall. They were light-skinned, blonde, blue-eyed, red-haired, uh, and green-eyed. That's the two descriptions we always get of them. And that pretty much defines the Nordic strain and also the red-haired strain that you find in Ireland and Scotland. Because that, where did that come from? Um, it's a complete uh, genetic uh, mismatch. And they seem to have come from the north of the world, it's said, in that part of the world. These, people, these magicians came from the north of the world. And the only people I could remember that came from that part of the, uh, of the world were the Tuatha de Danan, who are none other than the Tuatha de Danu. The name keeps altering depending on your country. The Irish, the Irish myth, the Irish story, yes. The Irish tradition. And suddenly I had a pincer point between Ireland and Orkney, which was the islands of Lewis, uh, which does fit in the trajectory of construction and dating quite well. And suddenly I understood why this place was called the landing place of Owanis. Uh, it's like, yeah, these people that were, for, were basically the same bloodline of magicians and great astronomers made a lot of sense. They formed a big civilization up there about five and a half thousand years ago. Uh, as things began to warm up, they began to move up north. So it was a wonderful moment where you sort of bring five different lines of inquiry into one just because of one name it, it triggers off a whole bunch of connections because you're looking for the key 
that holds these things together, these breadcrumbs together. And that absolutely. I, I remember in the documentary they showed, they showed the um, yeah, where well, they started in was it Mesopotamia first? Was it that's where they were? And then in, it's is it Scythia? Yeah, Scythia. They become Scythia, the, uh, Mesopotamia, Scythia, and then and then that journey along the Danube and through Romania, and that was yeah, that's extraordinary. Damn exactly. Sure. Because their, their, their culture was around the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. In fact, the, uh, the British culture of uh, the mounds, the giants' graves, actually goes back to the city. They have giants' graves and mounds there that make ours look really much like molehills. I mean, these things are huge. They look like miniature mountains. And again, it's only the third section of the front that's actually built with, with a core wall chamber. The rest is just uh, layers of earth soil and the inorganic material just like we have in Britain so the building tradition also follows them uh, but there was also a split uh, once they uh, a, a part of the house of Troy and during the Trojan Wars the house of Scythia also split they're married with the Egyptians which is another story and then they travel through the Mediterranean they eventually uh, founded one of the oldest cities in Europe uh, which is kind of near where I was born which is in Braga in Portugal mm -hmm. uh, that's very much a, a, a Trojan um, location. And then they made their way to the south of England, uh, down to um, Devon, where, where they had a big culture, and they eventually moved to London, uh, which back then was called Kera Flandin, uh, which is like Welsh. So the Welsh were the original Britons. And, and uh, they almost got away with changing uh, the name of the, uh, the town to Ker Troia. So there's a big Trojan city of tradition in Britain, and now that makes a lot of sense because part of these stories that we find from Ireland, where they still carry their body traditions, was that not only did their gods come from the north, which would have had to be in Orkney, because you couldn't get any further north, it was uninhabitable back then, um, and the other one came from the south, from the Basque region. Uh, this is why the Irish people get that jet black hair from the Spanish culture, but they also inherited the reddish hair and that's part of the Scythian Anu culture that came through the Mediterranean, landed in Iberia, took over the Basque region, and then made their way north to Ireland and Scotland. And uh, I've just found out, you know, we know so little about the Basque people. Well, if you just asked them, they would have told you that they were originally came from Armenia. So now you have that connection too. Amazing. And a lot of names in, in the Basque country are all Armenian. Incredible. Wow. And, and of course, you've got the probably jumping ahead slightly, but you've got the brochs there, haven't you, in uh, the Isle, Isle of Lewis, and you've got the, is it the uh, Nuragi in um, Sardinia? Sorry, yeah. So so would those two, when you said the kind of split who went in two, would, would the branch that went down to the south and eventually to Portugal, would they have sort of taken in Sardinia and Mediterranean and or not? Oh, absolutely. They would absolutely. Have, that's the point, yeah. In fact, I was doing a, a programme with Gaia, um, a couple of years ago with Regina Meredith who we went to Sardinia to have a look at this and um, so all this is in the back of Scotland's in the back of my mind right now and uh, I, I was doing some research on Sardinia and I thought I'm fascinated by the neuragic culture because the Sardinians don't know what neuragic means no one knows what it means <laughs> and, and the word doesn't even appear in Sardinian so where the hell does the word come from uh, it turns out um, that the, the word is actually Armenian uh, it, it's a uh, it means uh, the uh, uh, white-skinned, bearded, shining people. And I thought, well, that's a shining one, uh, which is the nickname given to the Lords of Anu. And it was always said, if I can paraphrase the late Lawrence Gardner, that the Lords of Anu had their main assembly in Mesopotamia thousands and thousands of years ago, and they used to meet in these round courts, these round towers. And I thought, and I'm looking at these round towers in Sardinia and thinking back to Scotland and going, you know, those round towers... Uh, they, they don't belong, the Brocks don't belong in Scotland. Every archaeologist talks about this. They, they're, they're out of place. They're com a complete misnomer in the west of Scotland. Where do they come from? And I'm looking at the construct of these buildings in Sardinia, and I'm going, ah, okay, that's where they come from because it's the same construction method. I mean, right down to the corkscrew interior wall. I mean, these things don't form any... Um, structure that you can use as a place to hide from people who are trying to kill you. You can't really put more than a dozen people comfortably in there. And that's a lot of work to build something just for 12 people. So obviously it was a meant of a place of assembly. And uh, also the fact that 
the uh, the temples that these in Raji are also astronomically aligned, and the, the one that I've done a lot of work on, the, the most complete one in Scotland, uh, in the Isle of Lewis, also is astronomically aligned, which is really goes far away and beyond the need for a place of habitation. If you build a building, you know, you kind of align it towards the uh, the south. Uh, to try and get as much light uh, into the building during the uh, the, uh, the winter, which is quite long in that part of the world. But no, the doors are inconveniently located towards the windiest and wettest part of the island. It doesn't make any sense. So I'm looking at these two together. I'm thinking, okay, the tradition of Sardinia talks about these giant people with red hair. Uh, and I'm talking about eight and a half feet tall, not purely giant, just very, very tall people. They were associated with Orion, uh, they were wisdom keepers, they were here after a major flood, and, uh, so we're thinking, okay, this is obviously tying into the part where the groups of the lords of Anu survived the great flood in 9000 BC, and they began to look for other places to live, because all the places that they had previously inhabited were rendered useless, or they actually were submerged. So we felt that Sardinia was perhaps one of those outposts that they used to rebuild their culture, and it seemed to fit with the local tradition. And from there, it was just a matter of going towards Mallorca, Menorca, because there's some structures which are also kind of similar, and similar stories. They go around, the, they follow the coastline through Portugal, and we had that tradition there. Uh, they call them the people of the serpent there, which is their badge of office. Uh, it, it seemed to be because they knew about the laws of nature, and that's why the serpent was always the symbol for that. And eventually you find that trajectory going all the way up through Ireland and then meeting up uh, with the, with the um, movement of the lords of Anu through Europe, through Scandinavia, from the north, uh, meeting up in the middle of the Scottish islands. So you had this double movement of, of the uh, culture. And the extended, <clears throat> the elongated heads as well, skulls as well, aren't and they also had the elongated skulls, which they also had in Sardinia. In fact, we were able to find some of the giant bones there. There's a, a very interesting farmer who's been playing with these bones since he was a little child. And he's been constantly harassed by the church and by the archaeologists, even by the police. Now, you don't harass children to that degree. And they're just telling him to keep, to keep his mouth shut about the giants and about pyramids. And they're all there. And we were able to actually get one of them. We're having the carbon-14 and the DNA tested. And, that, and the result should be quite uh, interesting. Oh, really? Um, yes, so, be... yeah, so, so if, I'm, if I'm suddenly assassinated, you'll know why. <laughs> <laughs> this is the last interview I've done. <laughs> yeah, so the trajectory appears to follow quite nicely because the, some of the archaeology that I was doing in Sardinia precedes that uh, by uh, about a thousand years what was happening on Orkney. So there is a definite movement of building and temple construction that goes from the south uh, through Europe and then all the way to the north of Scotland. So the timing appears to follow the migratory pattern as well. Fantastic.